In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, as we gather together in your name to consider this amazing, incredible sacrament, which is the Eucharist, I ask you to help us to do that, admitting to you that in our humanness and in our human understanding, it's really not possible. We're totally reliant on your Holy Spirit. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to work through me and the conversation that we'll have to just um, spark that understanding that we're into something that's truly divine and miraculous. And let that give us an appetite for the goodness that you've provided your people in this sacrament that will grow and grow and bring us to love you more and more. In Christ's name I pray, amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, as I said, we're going to consider the sacrament of the Eucharist starting today, and we're going to give it two weeks. In justice, we should give it 10 or 12 weeks. But we're going to give it two weeks anyway. Um, the Catechism of the Catholic Church used a phrase, I think that came out of the Second Vatican Council, that says that the Eucharist is the source and the summit of the Christian life. Fancy words. Source and summit. What does that mean? That somehow we take from it a resource that we need to live the Christian life. And that also when we come to the Eucharist, we bring back to it the sacrifice of our lives, the thanksgiving for the blessings that we received, and the honest needs that we have for forgiveness and to be resupplied for the next round, okay? Source and summit of the Christian life. Now, for it to be that meaningful in the Christian life, it must be more than just a symbolic gesture, right? Would you agree, please? All right, because we consider it a sacrament, which means it has to be much more than a symbolic gesture. And of course, and of course it is. Those are all just fancy words right now. Um, if you don't understand the Eucharist at this point, whether you're here or at some point watching online, I hope by the time we get done, it explodes in its meaning for you, okay? Because of all the gifts that Christ gave us besides salvation itself, this, I propose to you, is the greatest. In fact, what I hope to prove to you in the ways of faith is that besides the resurrection the Eucharist is Christ's greatest miracle if I was to ask you what is his greatest miracle you might say besides the, his own resurrection you might say a lot of other things but I propose to you none of them if we understand the Eucharist the way that scripture proposes it and we're going to look at that there is none that comes close. Big talk, huh? All right, I'm relying on God. As I told some of them before you got here, I'm not tremendously well prepared for this today. We got back from a trip Friday to a wonderful, blessed trip to Fatima and Lourdes. And every time I've had some spare time that I should have been working on my Bible study and my homily, I took a nap because I'm battling a little jet lag and I'm still a little fuzzy headed today. But uh, please, God, will help, help me. All right? There's three general topics I think you have to consider when you talk about the Eucharist. And I don't know if we'll do them in order or just morph them all together. But one is the age of prefigurement. That is, the Eucharist didn't just occur as a late-breaking idea to Jesus at the Last Supper. It had been foretold and prefigured in part for centuries, thousands of years in the Old Testament. We'll look at least a few of those streams of prophecy because they all come together in, fulfill, in fullness there at the Last Supper. The other thing I want to talk about is the Last Supper. And, and when I say the Last Supper, I want you to understand when we get done, it was more than just the meal that Jesus and the apostles shared in the upper room. You must understand that it also included the death, and the death of Jesus Christ. His arrest, his passion, his crucifixion and death. All part of the Last Supper. 
And then the third thing we want to discuss, and it probably won't be until next week, is how that event developed into the Mass. Because when we have the Mass, we say we are celebrating the Last Supper. All right? And you say, well, it doesn't look like it. But I want to, get, I want to, I want to try to fill in some of the gaps. All right? How we got from the rudimentary form of the sacrament to the way we celebrate it today, next week. All right. Do you remember when we talked about in Genesis the various covenants that Abraham and others established in Jesus? Remember? The covenants. And to establish a covenant, do you remember some of the elements that were necessary in all of the covenants that we discussed? Blood. There, was, there was blood. There was a sacrifice. And in most of them, then, there was a meal. Okay? Blood, a sacrifice, and a meal. Let's begin with this. At the Last Supper, Jesus picked... Now, you remember what they were actually celebrating, or what the apostles thought they were celebrating when they gathered in the upper room? Passover. The Passover. Like good Jews, they gathered every year for the Passover, which itself is a prefiguring prophetic statement about the Eucharist. And we'll touch on that, I hope. But they gather together. Jesus, as the presiding elder of the group, is doing just what the Passover prescribed doing, up to a point. There's no lamb mentioned in the upper room Passover meal, by the way, in any of the accounts. Jesus takes the elements of bread and wine. He lifts them up and he says, this is the cup of my blood, this is my flesh. And he says, this is the cup of the new and the everlasting covenant. Okay? Jesus is establishing a new covenant. He's giving them the covenant meal. What's missing is the sacrifice and the blood. That's why you have to understand the passion and the death of Jesus Christ is part of the upper, upper room event. And, and, and this is one way you can do that. You remember the Jewish day started at sundown and it went to the following sundown, okay? It wasn't midnight to midnight. So they're gathered on Thursday evening to celebrate the Last Supper, the Passover meal, right? There should have been four cups. That's prescribed in, in, in Jewish tradition, four cups that are offered during the Passover. If you read the account carefully... They only offered three. Then they, they did what was proper next, which was sing the great Hallel, which is a group of psalms that were sung, or still sung, at the Seder meal, the Passover meal. But it says then they left, and they went to the, the Mount of Olives. And Jesus, in fact, had said, I'll not drink wine again till I drink it in the kingdom of heaven. Right? That night he's arrested. There's an illegal trial during the night. He's brought the pilot in the morning, condemned to death. He goes to his passion, carries the cross. He's whipped, he's stripped. He's nailed on the cross, and he dies before sundown the next day. It's all part of the same day. You understand? A lot happened, but in the scripture, it's all part of the same day. And hanging on the cross just before he offers his spirit to God the Father, he says, I thirst. And they offer him wine on a sponge. He drinks it and he says, it is finished. It is finished. And more than one theologian has said, when that, to the answer to the question, what's finished, what was finished was the la unfinished Last Supper. The missing sacrifice had been provided. The blood had been shed. The missing lamb had been supplied. And it was the Lamb of God, as Paul, I mean, as John the Baptist said. Remember what he said the first time he saw Jesus? Behold, the Lamb of God. And the people standing around must have been thinking, what is he talking about? What a title. The Lamb of God. He was prophesying Jesus as the sacrifice for the new and the everlasting covenant that he established in his own blood. 
He being the priest and he being the sacrifice. What a wonderful mystery. Okay. One of the prophetic events that pointed to the Last Supper, just one of them, was, was Abraham. And we studied him when we looked at Genesis last, right? And he says, and it was his greatest trial. He'd been through several. This was the one that actually proved his faith the strongest and the one that earned for him the greatest promises of God. It's when he was told to take Isaac, your only son, the son through whom I have promised to make you a multitude of nations. I want you to take him up to Mount Moriah, and I want you to offer him to, him to me as a sacrifice. And Abraham was willing to do it. Willing to do it. And there's so much prophetic inference here. Isaac is made to carry the wood of his sacrifice, which was to be, he was to be killed and then burned, on his own back. The one to be sacrificed. Up Mount Moriah, which we know from the Psalms, is the Mount of Jerusalem, where Calvary is. 1,500 years later, 1,800 years later, okay? So we have the one to be sacrificed, the son, carrying the wood up Mount Moriah. When he gets to the top, you know, he's... He, his, his father's 90 plus years old. Isaac is 15, 16 years old. When, when, when Abraham binds his hands and he realizes that he's going to be killed as a sacrifice, this could, could have taken him. Right? <laughs> if he had wanted to get away, he could have gotten away, but he didn't. He obeyed his father. He was bound. He laid down on the wood. I don't know what was going through his mind. And Abraham raises the knife to sacrifice his son. And the, and the angel says, stop. Don't do it. You've proved your faith. You will not be the one that will offer the sacrifice, this ultimate sacrifice. Right? God provided a ram that was tangled in the bushes. And that lamb, that ram, sacri uh, substituted for Isaac that day. But the ultimate substitution was to be provided on Mount Moriah by God when he offered his own son who carried the wood of his cross up Mount Moriah and who was sacrificed. This is an important part of it to, um, to see. Also the Passover itself. You know the Passover event, right? So you've seen the movie. <laughs> Let my people go. I watched that movie, the new one on the plane on the way over. What was it called? Anyway, never mind. What is it? Gods and generals. Gods and generals, right. It's okay. But anyway, Moses, Moses is doing these miracles by God's command to try to convince Pharaoh to let the people go, and he's so resistant. The one that worked was the last one, where he said, tonight an angel of death is going to pass through all of Egypt. And all of the firstborn males, not just of the people, but even of the animals and the flocks, will die tonight, including Pharaoh's own son. The way the, the, the Israelites were spared was they were to take an unblemished lamb. Unblemished means had no defects to it. They were to kill it in a very specific way. That means they were to sacrifice it by splitting it down the diaphragm and opening it up so that none of the bones would be broken. They were to roast it, and they were to gather together and eat it. And they were to take and eat it, by the way. And they were supposed to take the blood of that lamb with a, and, and dip a hyssop stick. Hyssop is a bush. And they were to cover the lentils or the opening around their door with that blood so that those home marked by the blood of the lamb would be spared. And those that were not marked by the blood of the lamb. And by the way, it wasn't just marking the blood of the lamb. You had to also eat the lamb. That was a very important prescription. All right? Do you see in this any of a prefigurement also of the crucifixion? By the way, John tells us that that sponge that they dipped in wine and offered to Jesus on the cross, the stick was a hyssop stick. What a detail. It's like sometimes I've been saying, sometimes God just shows off. 
And it's just like, no, you know, you, you live all your life and suddenly you realize that and you think, oh, man, that's so good. <laughs> you know, God just went to all the trouble to make that connection there by that little detail. Is it essential for salvation? Absolutely not. But when you see that kind of thing, you just think, wow, that's cool. It's really cool. Jay, um, I was thinking the other day, I don't know why it's weird, because I didn't know what the Eucharist was for. I was reading something, and so I triggered an idea in my head. I don't know if it's weird or not. But um, looking back to the history of us, the God of Eden, and I was it's kind of a question. God created this little place for Adam and Eve. You know, how long they were there before they screwed up. But, you know, they couldn't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But there was a tree of life. And it's never said they couldn't eat the fruit because maybe they didn't have any fruit yet. Because if that represented Jesus, then that whole thing hadn't played out yet anyway. So they couldn't partake of Jesus as we can. Does that make sense? I'll have to think about it. Um, when they were barred from the Garden of Eden, it was specifically to bar them from the Tree of Life. And, you, and, you know, they now experienced mortal death. There was no death before that. But not being able to eat from the Tree of Life, symbolically, or maybe actually, initiated death through their sin into the world. God didn't want anyone to eat from the Tree of Life and live forever in that sin. Now, when you look at the book of Revelation... And John is looking at heaven. He sees a stream, and beside it is planted the tree of life, freely accessible to all who are there. So in a way, you might say, heaven is access to the Garden of Eden, paradise, which we were locked out of at the fall. Um, so yes, that all, that all comes together. How that ties together with Jesus as being the font of life, and the tree of life, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no life except in me, etc. So is he connected with the tree of life? Absolutely. Absolutely. He's our access. He says, there's no salvation except through me. It's all ways of maybe saying the same thing, right? Access again to the tree of life, but now to live forever uh, healed. When, when you first started talking, a thought came into my mind that his story began by telling us through Adam and Eve, don't eat this object. Don't eat it. The story ends by him telling us, this is the only way to live, is by eating this object. Right. Bookends to me. They just mm -hmm. seem like... Bookends. Very good. It all ties together. It does. The more you contemplate it, the longer you live... The more you pray through the scriptures, the more you're here. It's just like an onion, and you peel off another la layer all the time. It's not like you ever say, okay, I mastered all that. I'm going to go on to something else. That's like a fish thinking I've drunk the ocean. It's, a, right. it's just, it's, it's the medium that we live in. This is the goodness of God, and, and this book, the Bible, is, an, is a portal into his mind and heart that just never quits giving the only limit is how long we keep we keep looking. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's absolutely true. There are certain fundamentals that are really important. Beyond that, like I said, then he just starts showing off. <laughs> the genius of God is just is just fathomless. And it's like every time you think, wow, I've seen the end of it, you turn a corner and there's <laughs> an, a, a, you know, an immense uh, universe of, of revelation there that you haven't even tasted. All right, so we have also that um, prefigurement, Abraham and Isaac. We also, of course, had Moses and the man in the desert. We'll do a little bit more about that one in a minute. But also, what about this bit about at the Eucharist, we don't have a lamb up there, right? We, could, we say Jesus is the lamb of God. We just use the elements of bread and wine. Like, like all sacraments, we have the prayers, we have the spiritual power, but we also have physical elements, just like Jesus did at the Last Supper, correct? But even that was prefigured. Uh, when we did Genesis, we talked about Melchizedek. You remember him? 
Melchizedek, the first man called a priest of God in the Bible. Abraham has a great victory against all odds. He goes to offer an offering to God for his victory and brings a tithe to God. But he doesn't bring directly to God. You would think, well, who outranks Abraham? Who? Why would Abraham do anything except just offer it to God himself, build his own little offering? But he doesn't do that. He takes it to <laughs> the king and the priest of Salem, which is on Mount Moriah. <laughs> and the priest and the king, his name is not Melchizedek. That's his title. We don't know his name. Melchizedek means king of righteousness. So the king of Salem is also has the title of king of righteousness. And he's the first man called a priest of God. And we, he has the respect uh, and the authority in Abraham's mind that he brings him the tithe of the, of the war. And Melchizedek makes an offering to God on behalf of Abraham. It's called the Todah offering. This is long before God gives the sacrifices of animals to the Israelites. Okay, long before the original sacrifice to God, made at the hands of the first man called an authentic priest of God, long before the priests of the Jewish nation through Aaron and the Levites existed. 500 years before, we have this mysterious character making an offering to God. And what did he offer? Bread and wine. Bread and wine. The animal sacrifices were, were imputed upon Israel almost as a punishment. Because the animals they were told at Mount Sinai, I want you now to offer for sin from now on, were the gods of Egypt. Remember they had, they had, they had done the golden calf thing as sort of a punishment to that. I want you to sacrifice these false gods to me from now on as part of your sacrifice. But before that, for all time up to then, the original sacrifice was bread and wine in the Todah offering. And Todah is a Hebrew word. It means thanksgiving. If they spoke Greek, they would have said Eucharistos. Eucharist means thanksgiving. So there's another stream of prophecy that all come together. So you can say, well then are we, is Jesus fulfilling the Passover? Or is he fulfilling the Todah? Or is he fulfilling the sacrifice of Abraham on Mount Moriah? The answer is yes. All of these, all of these spoke in part to what he brought to fulfillment there at the Last Supper. All of these elements. This is also when we, re we studied the book of Hebrews, we saw how the author made a big point of answering the question, well, if Jesus is the great high priest, why isn't he a Levite? Remember? He was from the tribe of Judah. Wrong tribe. And the author of Hebrews makes the point because that's not his priesthood. He is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. We say it at every Mass. The original, not the priesthood that was instilled because of punishment, but the original priesthood of God. And by the way, that priesthood was, the priest was the eldest brother of the entire family. Right? So we have Jesus Christ as our eldest brother in the new family of God representing us. And the Levites, by the way, only exercised their priesthood until they were 50 years old. They started at 30 and they ended at 50. In the original preternatural priesthood, you were the high priest as long as you lived. Which for Jesus is forever. All right? It all comes together. And in a beautiful way, it's kind of like hard to put in a box. It's a beautiful thing. So Jesus, our high priest, a priest in the order of Melchizedek then, is rightfully the high priest because he is the righteous firstborn son of the family of God. We are also now also called children of God. Not equal with Jesus, but, but younger brothers and sisters. A beautiful thing through baptism. It's the rebirth. Birth into what? Into the family of God. With Jesus being the righteous elder brother. 
And in the order of Melchizedek, the original priesthood, the way God designed it, he offers sacrifices to God on our behalf. What's the sacrifice? The only perfect sacrifice that's ever been offered himself. And he allows us to participate in that through the sacrament of the Last Supper, which he instituted there the night before he died, on the same day before he died. It's very important. The other thing that's hard to wrap your brain about, but which is very important to understand, is that we do believe the Eucharist, the Mass, is a sacrifice. But we don't re-sacrifice Jesus Christ. He's been sacrificed once and for all. And this is one way that it's a miracle beyond comprehension. What Jesus, what we believe, is that when we celebrate the Mass, we don't, we are present at the Last Supper. And that means also present at the foot of the cross. Unfortunately, the word in English is the, is the same. We don't represent the Last Supper. We re-present the Last Supper. In Greek, they've got a word called anamnesis. That means make present again. And it means beyond, never, regardless of time and space, when we gather in his name at the Eucharist, we are present at that Last Supper and at the foot of the cross. Just letting that sink in a little bit because it's pretty hard to get. We don't feel it. We don't see it. It's something you can only know by faith. But if you dare to believe it's true, it's one of the reasons I say there's no miracle greater than this one. Larry? The anamnesis of representing also occurs in Passover which is what the Jews use It's the same terminology that the Jews use when they celebrate the Passover, that somehow, yeah, that they make it, they make it a current event for themselves. Which is what he was celebrating. Which is what he was celebrating at the Last Supper. That's right. Okay. Or it's like a time travel. You travel right straight back. Yeah. It, it, it is. That's not, that's not too out there to say. No. It's not. It sounds a little science fiction, you know, but it's a... It works for me. It, it, but it works for you. That's great. <laughs> I mean, I, the, the truth is, if in faith we, we accept this amazing proposition, yes. when we step into Mass, we step outside of time and space, and we are present there. This is, why, this is why the apostles that were there have no advantage over you and I. The ladies at the foot of the cross and John have no advantage over you and I. And, and I'll tell you this, when Jesus was at the Last Supper and when he was hanging on the cross, he saw you there. And he said, I'm doing this for you. You who haven't even been born yet, who haven't even done those things yet that I'm dying for. When it comes time for you to know it, know that this is why I'm doing it. Do this in memory of me. That was his command to his apostles. You have to have faith to realize you go back because you The gift of faith. Faith is the way we can know things, see things, understand things that are beyond our natural limits. And this is definitely one of them. It is preposterous to a person who unfortunately limits themselves to accepting only what they can know in their mind or touch with their fingers mm -hmm. or see with their eyes, which in fact nobody actually does. <laughs> of course they don't. No. Most 99% of the things we know, we know because we trust the person that told us. I mean, atomic physics, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Kuala Lumpur, I mean, you know, do you, does that exist? Do, do neutrons and electrons actually spin around? Most of us say yes. We'll say, have you seen it? Have you tasted it? Do you even understand it? <laughs> of course not. You flip on a switch. Can you explain the traveling of electrons through the wires that somehow comes from a hydroelectric plant somewhere? Not me. I said that like I understand it, but I don't understand it. 
All right? So most of the things we know, we know because we simply trust the source. It's simply a matter of taking that another step. Because God said this, Christ said this, we just lift the limits on what we're willing to accept as true. And if we do that, then we are able to not just understand natural things, but supernatural things. Not because they're illogical, but because they're super logical and can only be known by faith. Faith is a gift from God to know things, even to see things, taste things, understand things that are beyond our natural senses. You see the results of it. Uh, and it, that's true, but I would say that we see the results of the grace of God too. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. What, what happens sometimes is we're too ignorant to, to correlate the two. <laughs> you know, I think of the guy who lost his car keys and he's late for an important meeting. He's saying, God, please help me find the car. Please help me find the car keys. Please, 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 I've got to find the car keys. Oh, please help me find the car keys. And he shakes and says, never mind. <laughs> Here they are. Yeah. Yeah. All right, yeah, you get it? So in our brain, it's like, <laughs> we're so ignorant. But anyway, <laughs> let's go now to the Last Supper, which I think you now see, I, I'm proposing to you, is not really where it all begins. God had been putting this event into place prophetically for thousands of years. All right? But now we have this explosion of revelation that's about to happen as all these streams of prophecy come together in the nexus of that table. But I don't want to start there. I want to start a year before. It's important too. In the sixth chapter of John, at the very beginning of it, there's a story. It says, Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee. A large crowd followed him, impressed by the signs that he had been doing, curing the sick. I'll paraphrase a little bit so we can go on or this will take too long. All right? It was the time of the Jewish Passover. This is one year before the Last Supper. Okay? One year before, he's in Galilee. He'd been working miracles. A large crowd gathers. He preaches to them. He says, looking up, Jesus saw the crowds approaching. It's out in a deserted place. Because originally they were going to have a couple of days off. But the people find them. Jesus has pity for them. So he teaches them all day instead. But then he says to Philip, where can we buy some bread for these people to eat? He said this to put Philip to the test because he knew what he was going to do. And Philip answered, 200 denarii, which is one day's wage, would not buy enough to give them a little piece each. One of his disciples, Andrew, Peter's brother, said, there is a small boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. So one little boy's mama packed him lunch at least. <laughs> Said, if you're going way out there to Jesus, just wait. You have to at least take some food. You get hungry. Jewish mama. Right, Jewish mama. Jesus said to them, make the people sit down. There was plenty of grass there, as many as 5,000 men. Obviously, there were women and children there as well. So we've got a big group. You know this story. Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks. If we were reading the Greek Bible right here, it said he eucharisted them, gave thanks for the loaves, and he distributed them to those who were sitting them there. And he did the same with the fish. When they had eaten, uh, he said to the disciples, pick up the pieces left over so that nothing is wasted. They picked them up and filled 12 large baskets, baskets with scraps left over from the meal. All right, five loaves, two fish. They end up with baskets and baskets and baskets left over. Lots to share with the poor, even after they'd eaten all they could. This was a miracle. Agreed? The people there also thought that this was pretty much a miracle. So they said, seeing the sign that he had done, the people said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus realized they were about to come and take him by force and make him king, went up into the hills alone. That evening the disciples went down to the shore, got into the boat, and they went to Cabernaum, which is five or six miles up the coast, but they were going the wrong way. At that time of the year, the wind's blowing the other way. 
It was getting dark by now. Jesus had still not joined them. The wind was strong. The sea was getting rough. They had rowed three or four miles. And they see Jesus walking on the water towards them. They were afraid. He says, it's me. Don't be afraid. They, he got into the boat and immediately they reached the shore at the place they were making for. The next morning, the crowds that were still back where he left saw that only one boat had left, but Jesus wasn't there. So they got into other boats that had set in from Tiberias, and they went looking for him, and they get to Capernaum, and they find him there. And they said, Rabbi, when did you come here? You went up into the hills, your disciples left, and you're here. How'd you do that? <laughs> he says, in truth I tell you, you're not looking for me because you have understood the signs, but because you had all the bread you wanted to eat. Do not work for food that goes bad, but work for food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him the Father God himself has set his seal. They said, what must we do if we are to carry out God's work? Jesus said, this is carrying out God's work. Believe in the one he has sent. So they said, what sign will you do, the sight of which will make us believe in you? Now here we're right at it. I started where I started because I wanted you to understand who's asking this question. Where were these people the day before? They were sitting in the grass and they, he did the miracle of the multiplication of the loaves. Right? All right. So when they say, what sign will you do to prove to us you are the prophet? That to us seems like a stupid question. It's like, what more do you want? But it wasn't a stupid fr question, my friend, because this title, the prophet, was given to them originally by Moses, who said, a prophet greater than me will come one day. And they came to understand that that meant the Messiah. And when they're saying, could he be the prophet, they meant, could he be the Messiah? And Moses said, he will do greater works than I do. All right? Well, the rabbis had taught these people of all of... Moses' miracles, the parting of the Red Sea, the turning of the Nile into blood, even the, 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 the death of the firstborn sons, his greatest miracle occurred out in the desert where they complained to him that we're out in the desert, we don't have anything to eat. And he prayed to God and God provided for them food from heaven. Manna. Manna. Every day for 40 years except on Friday where they got twice as much, and on the Sabbath, Saturday, they didn't, they didn't work, okay? So every day for 40 years. Now in the narrative, there's hundreds of thousands of these Israelites. So get a picture. Feeding hundreds of thousands of people every day, I don't know, what is that, a 40 boxcar train pulling up from heaven and feeding everyone every day for 40 years. They were taught this was the greatest miracle of Moses, okay? And it makes sense. But Moses says the one coming will work a miracle greater than I. So when they say, what sign are you going to give us that you're the, the prophet feeding 5,000 men, maybe 10,000 people lunch one day is impressive, but that's not good enough. You get it? In the context, the question to their understanding, which we didn't understand, but we do now, is perfectly logical and appropriate. What sign will you yourself do, the sight of which will make us believe in you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate manna in the desert. As it is written in Exodus 16, 1, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. All right, so I didn't make this up. What I just said is makes sense with the context, correct? All right. Jesus' answer. And all truth I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. It was my Father who gives you the bread from heaven, the true bread. For the bread of God is the bread which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said, sir, give us that bread always. Sounds good. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. No one who comes to me will ever hunger. No one who believes in me will ever thirst. I'm going to skip ahead. The Jews started complaining to each other because he had said, I am the bread of life. 
that has come down from heaven. They were saying, surely this is Jesus, son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know. How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus says to them, stop complaining. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sends me. Verse 47, he says it for the second time now. In all truth, that's oath language. Jesus is saying, I swear to you. Everyone who believes has eternal life. Well, believes what? That I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the desert, and they are dead. But this is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that a person may eat it and not die for the third time. I am the living bread which has come down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I shall give, fourth time, is my flesh for the life of the world. The Jews start arguing. They start complaining. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Good question. To them, he just said something that sounded like cannibalism, not just against Jewish law, it's against everybody's law. All right? How can this man give us his flesh to eat? In all truth, again, oath language. Your Bible may say, amen, amen. Again, he says, I'm swearing to you. If you do not eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. For the fifth time, anyone who does eat my flesh and drink my blood has eternal life, and I shall raise that person up on the last day. Number six, for my flesh is real food. My blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me, and I live in that person. As the living Father sent me, and I draw life from the Father, so whoever eats me will also draw life from me. For the seventh time, this is the bread which has come down from heaven, not like the bread our ancestors ate. They are dead. But anyone who eats this bread will live forever. The next verse begins a very sad strophe. After hearing this, Many of his followers said, this is intolerable language. How can anyone accept it? They take this literally. He, they're saying, how can anyone accept this? A lot of Christians today still say, how can anyone accept this? Now, in other places where the disciples were taking Jesus literally, but he was speaking symbolically, he corrected them. One time he says, beware the yeast of the Pharisees. And they say, oh, it's because we forgot to bring bread for lunch. He said, no, 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 no. I'm talking about the teaching of the Pharisees, for instance, and there are others. Jesus does not do this here. Thousands of people that were willing to follow him yesterday and even this morning are now on the verge of leaving. There's a riot breaking out because of what he says. And he does not back up an inch. But he tells them the only way they can understand what he's saying. He says, it is the spirit that gives life. The flesh has nothing to offer. The words I have spoken to you are spirit, and they are life. That verse is sometimes taken to say, okay, well, Jesus was speaking about a spiritual thing, not literally. Therefore, Catholics are taking this too literally. We're the fundamentalists here, I guess. But I ask you this, without going into too much other, and you can answer for yourself. They were asking him for the miracle greater than Moses feeding the Israelites for 40 years in the desert. If Jesus was, act, was talking about a symbolic gesture of passing a loaf of bread around, and we all pull off a piece and eat it, and it symbolizes that we're all friends here, does that trump a man a miracle? They're asking for the signature miracle that proves that you are the Messiah. Does anything less than a literal interpretation of what he's saying here fulfill that answer? 
If a symbol symbolic gesture would do it, I could come up with something better than that. That was a rhetorical question. I, go ahead. If it was just a symbolic gesture, then one would ask the question, why is Paul so concerned about taking of this bread with unrepentant hearts? Well, I mean, if it that was, nails it down, right. I guess, again, Paul in 1 Corinthians is talking about those who do not, those who receive the Eucharist in bad faith are guilty of sacrilege, blasphemy against the Lord. And in fact, he goes on to say, because of this, many of you are sick and some have died. So he's taking it pretty seriously. Let me go on. There are some of you who do not believe. Jesus knew who did not believe. And he went on. This is why I told you that no one could come to me except by the gift of the Father, which is faith. The gift of the Father, which is faith. The saddest line in the entire Bible. After this, many of his disciples went away and accompanied him no more. It's John 6, 6, 6. John chapter 6, verse 66. Many of those disciples, when he put it down, it says, I want you to believe in me on this basis of the impossible claims that I make that you can know only by faith despite all of your natural barriers. That's what I want. And most of them walked away that day on that question. Florence? I have a very simple explanation to my friends that are not Catholic when they say how can you believe that Jesus was God. God spoke the world into being. God said, this is my, Jesus said, this is my body. I don't have a problem with that. That's right. The created word said, this is my body. So it is his body, right? right. I've told people before, if God, Jesus pointed to you and said, you are an ostrich, guess what? He didn't lie. You're an ostrich. The created word of God brings about what it speaks. So if, if nothing more than that, just simply believing that Jesus is God, by him saying that makes it truth. Thank you. But let me, let me, let me go on because there's an important... Huh? It's just as important when John at the beginning of his gospel says in the beginning was the Word. Right. This is John who said in the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. And we saw Him. We ate with Him. He knows who Jesus is. He says from the beginning He is the one who spoke creation into existence. He's recreating some of that existence right here. All right? Through the same powerful Word. Uh, just a just, uh, few points. First is that uh, uh, when he said uh, flesh is spirit that is life, uh, flesh has nothing to offer. You know, first we've got to understand that at that point he was referring to seeing with the eyes of faith, seeing spiritually and not seeing fleshly. We can also see, we can also see uh, uh, an alternative to that in uh, John 8, 15, where he, he made it clear that what he meant by flesh here was not that the body has the, is of no affair, because <laughs> that's often the point some people emphasize that when he says the flesh is of no affair, the thing that he now meant that the body has not a dog, that was what Christ meant. That was that would be proving too much, you know. So he actually meant that seeing fleshly or living fleshly offers nothing. But seeing spiritually, seeing with the eyes of faith, offers everything. And it's exactly what he's saying in that particular verse. You know, he says the flesh is of no avail. The eyes of flesh, human understanding, will not lead you to this conclusion. It is impossible. However, most of them left. The rest of this story is important. Jesus turns around. He sees the apostles standing there. From the context of the story, they're the only ones standing there. And he says, are you two going to leave? Peter speaks for the rest and he says, where are we going to go? He did not say, oh no, we, have, we understand, no problem. 
<laughs> he said, where else are we going to go? We've come to believe that you are the chosen one and you have the words of eternal life. So we're staying. And Jesus says, right now, that's all I'm asking. That's all I'm asking. But from there forward, the apostles certainly still had in their mind, he given us this impossibly hard teaching, how is it going to come about? I tell you all this because we're speaking about the Last Supper. I want you now to spin ahead one year to the next Passover. Now they're at the Last Supper. And in the context of what they had experienced there, now Jesus picks up the bread and the wine and he says, this is my flesh. This is my blood. Look at the logistical problem the apostles had to have. Even if we do roast him and eat him, take it quite literally, how is that going to be enough for the whole world? How is that going to be enough for the believers to come? How is that going to be enough except for a very small group? That alone, even if you got over the yuckiness of the problem at hand, very logistically, is, that isn't going to do it. But now Jesus says, this is my flesh, this is my blood, do this in memory of me everywhere you go, and there'll be enough. Jesus. Boom. <laughs> Boom. I could just imagine the apostles thinking, and what they're saying is, that's how he's going to do it. Right? He is going to, do a miracle, change these elements of the Passover now into the covenant meal of the new covenant, and everywhere we go, and those that we ordain go, and do this, there's going to be enough. There's going to be enough for billions. Not thousands for 40 years. Billions of people for all time until he comes again. Does that trump the manna miracle? Does that, is that, so is this the signature miracle of the prophet that they ask for? Yes. And not only that interpretation fits the context of the whole story. Nate? That scripture there where he turns the you and all that. When you're talking with a Protestant, I found that this is the most significant thing. Most people skip over it when they go to the bread of life, you know, you must eat it to have life in you and all this stuff. But I think the biggest knockout punch, and I'm talking to people who say this is symbolic, that we do this as a sign of community, we come together, blah, blah, blah. That scripture, at that point, after he says three different ways, I am... It's one. seven ways. And you need to consume me. Some of these guys, who at this point have already ruined their reputation, by following, they get up and leave. And Jesus doesn't say, whoa, 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 guys, you misunderstood. I was just being romantic and philosophical, whatever, come back. They return to their former way of life. That meant it had to be something that totally rocked their world, and they said, I'm out. This is too much for me. At that point, they leave, and they're gone. And nobody tries to bring them back because it's too much. And then he says, Peter, what are you going to do? He says, you ruined my life. Where am I going to go? <laughs> That's true. The point is that their simple act of obedience is all God wanted right there. And there's more to it than this. Let's be honest. Many Catholics, and I don't know the percentage, go to Mass all the time. And they don't believe this. The real presence, this miracle aspect of it. So it's, we we can't point too many fig fingers. We haven't left, but in some ways, if you don't believe it and you leave, is more intellectually honest than saying, well, I'm going to stay for other reasons. Here's the thing. Jesus is asking us to accept him on his terms. And if that requires subjecting in humility our pride and our understanding to something that we don't understand, he's saying, so be it. Do that and it'll set you free. All right? The key to a whole new level of understanding is accepting things in faith. All I'm trying to say, say here is that Jesus put it together for these apostles. And if these other disciples had chosen to stay, not limited by their understanding, but simply as Peter said, 
I don't understand it either, but it must be true. It must be true. I'll let you work it out in your good time as far as what I'm supposed to do with it. That's all he wanted. A lot of times that's all he wants with us. A lot of times that's all he wants with us. When we're in situations we don't understand, we don't like, we don't want to go forward, don't leave. It ain't over yet, all right? The story of the Eucharist for the apostles is that it ended up more gloriously than they could ever imagine. And thank God at least 12 stayed because of them, billions have enjoyed the bread of life and still do. And many of us will in 15 minutes. <laughs> Let's pray. In the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, please God, I ask you to unlock the unlimited treasure of revelation that is in this sacrament to us. Lift us up so that when we go to Mass and when we receive you and when we hear your word, we truly perceive that we are in your presence. More than that, we're in you. Folded into the glory and the light, which is the mighty Son of God. And in you, there is no limit to what we can be. In you, there is no limit to what we can do nourished by your body and blood. Give us the supernatural gifts we need to be faithful all our lives. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. In the name of Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. In the name of Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God, we thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the manifold gifts of the Holy Spirit, beginning with the ability to have a true faith and understanding in the mysteries of of the supernatural revelation of God in Jesus Christ, which leads us to the, the gift of love as well, to be able to love as God loves, love God first and love each other, and to know the love of God. Lord God, make those uh, solid in us, first and foremost, so that all the other gifts and fruits of the Holy Spirit can be evident in our life, just in the way that we need them to serve you well. And I ask that today, Lord, in our study, somehow or another, it... Uh, enriches and enables that process in our lives to bring us closer to you, to worship you more properly, to appreciate you more genuinely, to love you more purely. In Christ's name I pray, amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right. So first of all, I begin with an apology. I made an uh, error last week, which is one that I make quite often. It's a tactical, strategic error. I knew there was too much material when we, when we did the Eucharist for one session. That much was right. I erroneously thought we could cover it in two. <laughs> and that's the reason I was going so fast last week. And I apologize because afterwards I had some people tell me, he said, well, you know, I, I, there was some comments I wanted to make and you didn't get to me and I, I'm sorry for that. That's not the way we, we should operate. So we're going to do three sessions on the Eucharist, okay? Huh? I couldn't be here last week. Did you start over? Uh -huh. <laughs> Make it four. No, but I have good news for you. Okay. It's, it'll be online. All right? so, we covered a lot of material last week. I told you way back when we began this study that of all the reasons in my own heart and mind it's wonderful to be Catholic, the best reason is the sacraments to me. This very reliable, wonderful, inexhaustible source of God's goodness and grace that we need, we absolutely must have to live the abundant life he says he wants us to have. And of those sacraments, the Eucharist is uh, at the top of the list, I think, uh, for me. Because on a practical day-to-day, -day, continually, you know, knocking my socks off kind of experience, the Eucharist is the one that we receive the most. And so I think it's right that we give it a little bit more time. We won't exhaust the topic even in three sessions, but I hope at least we can uh, put some practically good and deep roots into it, okay? To just briefly recap, <laughs> Ron, what I, what I said I thought I wanted to do 
was to talk about the Eucharist in the Old Testament. I just alluded to it, really. We ripped through it because it's prophetically there. I did, and the point was I didn't want anybody to think that the Eucharist began at the Last Supper. as like God tried all these other things. Now we're going to do this. But I got a new idea. <laughs> it's, it was part and parcel of the new covenant reality, the brilliance, the culmination of salvation history that he had started from the very beginning. And we just pointed at a, a few of those streams of, of uh, anticipatory, prophetic uh, message in the Old Testament, some of which was in the animal sacrifices, some of it which was in the uh, covenant communion meal, some of it was in the sacrifices of individuals, Abraham and Isaac, or uh, Abel, way back, you know, in Genesis. We talked about Melchizedek and the Todah, or the Thanksgiving offering. We talked about the Passover meal. All of these and others are all part of the picture that was coming together, and which at the Last Supper, you know, became in reality what had been anticipated in hope. So, uh, but even at, and then we spent some time talking about that Last Supper, but it was set up not at the Last Supper, even in Jesus' time. I thought it was very important for us to understand. It was basically the answer to a question that he had put in the apostles' hearts and minds, a big one, a year earlier. When in Capernaum, after the day after he fed the 5,000 with the seven loaves and the few fish, the very next day, they find him in Capernaum, the same people, and that was interesting for us and important for us to understand. The same people that saw him work that miracle now ask him, if you're the Messiah, what sign are you going to give us? Okay, what miracle are you going to do? And in some sense, we might say that was a silly question because they had just seen him work this, you know, Mac Daddy miracle. He'd fed lunch to thousands and thousands of people with just a few loaves of bread. But no, in the context of, of their Jewishness and their upbringing, it was perfectly appropriate because they had been taught that when the Messiah comes, he'll be a greater prophet even than Moses. Moses himself said that back in Deuteronomy, okay? A prophet will come greater than I. And to them that meant that he then therefore would have a signature miracle that would be even greater than the signature miracle of Moses, which was the manna in the desert. Okay, so, and the manna in the desert was feeding tens of thousands of people every day for 40 years. So yes, that was a bigger miracle than lunch for 5,000 men, or, you know, a big group, as good as that was. And it was in answer to that question then that he said, I am the bread from heaven, the real bread from heaven. The manna wasn't the real bread, that was just a sign. I'm what it's pointed to the living bread that comes from heaven. And if you eat this bread, you'll live forever. Your ancestors ate the manna in the desert. And he says, but they died. If you eat this bread, you'll live forever. And then they said, that sounds good. That probably will do it. Give us that bread. But that's when, he got, that's when it got hard. And we went through that in John chapter 6. The drama of the moment should not be lost on us because he hammered it over to them over and over and over. The bread from heaven is my flesh. You must eat my flesh, drink my blood. And I think it was seven times he said it in seven different ways and just hammered it home that he was talking about something literal and in, and in the human understanding quite incomprehensible and even revolting. No. Right. The Greek word he was using not just eat but gnaw, chew. Devour. Right. And they, and they end up saying, most of them, the vast majority of them who had seen him work this miracle, they said, this is intolerable language. Who can, who can stand this? And most of them walked away that day. It was John 6, 6, 6. I always like to pause after I say that. John 6, 6, 6. John chapter 6, verse 66. And in hearing this, they walked away. Those who had been willing to be his disciples and proclaim him, proclaim him King and Messiah walked away on that point. Yes, ma'am. Well, we don't know if it was just the 12. It doesn't say that specifically, but you sure get the feeling from the reading the context there weren't a whole lot more. Because Jesus is talking to the crowd, and it says, 
they walked away was that 50%, 90%, 100%, we don't know. Then he turns and looks to the apostles. Where there are 12 apostles, you know, it was a bigger group that was called disciples too. And he says, are you going to walk away too? And that's where Peter, good old Peter, says, and he didn't say, no, we got it, no problem. <laughs> yeah, you know, just tell us when the barbecue is supposed to happen and we're on it. <laughs> Sorry, Lord. I... But, I mean, what else was he dealing with in his, in his mind, right? Now, his answer is, Lord, we've come to believe that you are the Messiah. You have the words of eternal life. Where else are we going to go? That was his answer. We trust you. We don't understand it. Let there be no mistake. But we trust you. And somehow or another, I guess our understanding will catch up later. That's faith, man. That's faith. It's stepping. Remember, Peter's the one that stepped out of the boat. He knows he's supposed to sink when he hits that water, right? He doesn't know how it's going to work. But when Jesus said, come to me, he said, well, okay. Same guy. All right. I know he sunk eventually, but he walked on water further than any of us have. <laughs> There's only two people that have ever walked on water. One's Jesus and the other's Peter, at least for a little while. So be careful when you start dissing Peter. You get it? <laughs> Bear Bryant. I don't ever say that again. <laughs> Bear Bryant. Roll Tide. All right. Thank you, Frank. Let me stop for a second and think what I was talking about now. <laughs> I, might, I immediately went to an SEC championship game that Georgia <laughs> lost in the last three seconds. Uh, no. All right. So at that day then, which was at the Passover time, if you remember, John was clear to point out to us, and he did it for a reason. It was at Passover time. And they were in Galilee. One year later then, they're at the Last Supper. This is where Jesus takes the wine and the bread, and there's no mention of lamb at, in John's rendition of this Last Supper, the pa which was a Passover meal. Jesus says, takes the bread, blesses it, breaks it, he Eucharisted it, just the same language he, he said he did at, there when he fed the 5,000. He, he thanked God, he blessed it, he broke it, he gave it to them, but this time he says, this is my body. He takes the cup and says, this is my blood. Okay? And I just propose to you that the apostles must have been sitting there having an aha moment. Have you ever had an aha moment? Yeah. It's just like the curtains pulled back and you went, what's Gomer Pyle say? Shazam. Right? <laughs> Shazam. So that's how he's going to do it. Right? Because it answers all those questions. It, and he tells them to do this now. You do this now. And from this day forward, you do this. And they can think, you know what? And if every time we do this, this becomes the body and blood of Jesus Christ, yes, there'll be enough of him for all people for all time. Billions of people having the bread from heaven which leads to eternal life, yes, that beats the man a miracle. The answer to the question. And I said all that because sometimes... Critics to our understanding of the Eucharist would say, no, it was a symbol. Jesus was talking symbolically. And the communion meal that the apostles did and that some churches do now is just a symbolic um, gesture of our fraternity, right? But in the context of the question that those people asked, what will you do that is a greater miracle than Moses and the man in the desert that doesn't, that's not enough. That doesn't suffice, right? That's why context is so important. I had an encounter with that this week uh, when I was in a Christian bookstore, and there was this man, I, somehow it was brought up that I was Catholic. Of course, I had do you want to know what you're doing in a Christian bookstore? And he said, I went to Catholic church one time. He said, they started talking about eating Jesus. And I said, no, I can't give in to that. Well, so there's a verse for him. It's John 6, 6, 6. I said, do you read your Bible? 
the Bible? He said, well, yes, ma'am, I read my Bible every day. I said, well, then he, you listen when Jesus tells you, do this in remembrance of me, eat my body. Yeah, but you're not eating his body. This went on for a few minutes. <laughs> it's just friends. But I stood up to <laughs> In love. In love. Speak the truth in love. You have to refrain from doing one of one of my sons says hitting him with the bazooka of truth. <laughs> I spoke truth and just blew his head off. <laughs> I don't think I don't think the Lord's pleased with that kind of but anyway. All right, so that's more or less where we were there today, that last week, where the at the Last Supper, Jesus took all of those partial meanings, atonement of sin. Thanksgiving, worship, praise, covenant renewal, all right, that were, that were implicit in all the Old Testament sacrifices, and he made it relevant and fulfilled and perfect in the new covenant meal, which he instituted at the Last Supper, and it is the Eucharist, all right? Now, my goal today is to take it a next step, which is to see what happened after the Last Supper. Okay. What happened after the Last Supper? And then what I would do, I'd like to do next week is talk about what all this means to you and me now today. I'll just leave it at that. We'll start there. After the Last Supper, of course, we have New Testament testimony. Before any of the Gospels were written, Paul wrote his first letter to the Corinthians. So we'll start there. So this was only a few years later. I should even start before that. Acts was written after this letter to Paul, but Acts is describing what was going on before Paul, okay? Before Paul found the faith. The book of Acts written by Luke says, for instance, in chapter 2, right after Pentecost, which we celebrate today, these remain... All right, so Peter had preached the, the first great sermon at Pentecost, okay. and 3,000 were added to their number that day. This is after the house rocked. Okay. okay? Very next line in chapter 3, verse 42. These remained faithful to the teaching of the apostles, to the brotherhood, and to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. Okay? We're not using the word mass yet. We're not using the word Eucharist yet. But the breaking of the bread was part and parcel to the way they understood from the very first day the church was born to what they were supposed to do as church. All right? I just wanted to point that out. And in uh, chapter 20 of Acts, it says it slightly differently. Oh. Now Paul, now Luke is up to where he's, he's covering the, the travels of Paul, and he's speaking of one event. And what I want you to notice in this is that he doesn't set it up, he doesn't explain it. It's just how matter-of-factly he just says this. He says that we went to Troas in chapter 20, verse 6. And on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, we met for the breaking of bread. Paul was due to leave the next day, and he preached a sermon that went on till the middle of the night. <laughs> it says he went on and on and on and the rest of the story is rather humorous a young man got bored he got drowsy, he fell out the window and they thought he'd broken his neck Paul goes down, brings him back to life sends him home and he goes up and he finishes preaching all night <laughs> uh, barely slowed him down so. but what, what were they doing? they met for the breaking of bread and the long sermon Paul's given was in the context of the breaking of the bread and Luke doesn't say, oh, this is what we did, blah, 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 blah. He just, he just states it rather matter-of-factly. They all knew this is what they did. And what Acts tells us, what these early disciples, the Jewish disciples would do, they would go to synagogue on Saturday, and on Sunday, the first day of the week, they would gather in their homes to offer the breaking of the bread, what became known as the Lord's Supper. 
pretty soon after that, okay? So they didn't do it in the temple. They understood this was not part of the temple worship of the old covenant. This was something new. And they did that in their homes, as all Christians did until about the 4th century when it was made legal to practice in a public building. Tom? Jay, would you say that um, two disciples on the road to Emmaus, Jesus had set up the exact order of Emmaus. First it was like a convivial chatting. Then he taught scripture, it wasn't in the temple, and then he wrote for us. Right. So, so the day after the resurrection, you're talking about the two disciples, unnamed disciples, who walk with him on the road to Emmaus, and he's explaining in the scriptures why the Messiah that they thought had been put to death, why, he need, why that had to happen. But it isn't until they sit at table, and it says he blesses the bread, th thanks God for it, breaks it, and gives it to them, that they recognize him as Jesus. It's interesting. They recognize him in the breaking of the bread. That's right, but that happened even before. It wasn't really a liturgy, so to speak, but you're right. Jesus revealing the reality of who he is through the breaking of the bread started happening in the day after the resurrection, okay? And it's becoming more and more evident. What I'm trying to get forth is that it's, it was the, uh, uh, the practice, the routine. It was the standard, part of the standard worship of this new community. What I'm trying to rail against is the complaint is that the Mass and the Eucharist is an invention of a superstitious church in the Middle Ages. That's what I'm trying to obliterate right here. I think by the time we're done, you're going to see there was never a time that the church that was born at Pentecost didn't believe what we believe today. And in fact, for 1,500 years, every Christian believed this. There was a schism in about the year 1000 between the Greek Orthodox and the Roman Catholic, but it wasn't over that. They still believed in what we call the real presence, calling it the Eucharist and all the rest. It wasn't until the 1500s that a late breaking new idea was introduced that it was simply a symbolic gesture. And, and, but even, to tell you the truth, even Martin, Martin Luther believed in the real presence. He had a great falling away from the other reformers over that issue. Calvin and Zwingli and some of the others said, no, 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 it's just symbolic to think something that spiritually important could happen in physical, in, in physical form is, no, you're just, you're just still being contaminated by Catholic thinking. But Martin Luther insisted on it, okay? They split up, condemned them, each other as heretics. <laughs> and, so it, and so it began. But my point is that for 1,500 years, there was no dissension on this point. We're having to go back and learn that. But this wasn't... This wasn't something they got together and debated. <laughs> it, it was the commonly held assumption and truth everywhere that people called themselves Christians gathered. All right, that's what I want to get to. Now let's go to Paul's letter to Corinthians. Just two places. And chapter 10 is the first one I want to hit. First Corinthians. Second first. Paul wrote two letters to the Corinthians, which were his, were his problem children. They're a very charismatic church, and that was great. He didn't condemn them for that. They were way into Pentecost and the gifts of the Holy Spirit and all that. But he said, you're letting that make you too arrogant. You're thinking you're better Christians than other people because these spiritual gifts are manifest in your community maybe more than some other places. He says, he says I speak in tongues more than all of you. But I'm telling you, so it's not that. What I'm telling you is that you think the gifts of the Holy Spirit are marks of your special holiness. They are given to you as gifts to build up the body of Christ to help you love more. So the first letter is about getting back to the basics, things that are even more important than the charismatic gifts that they experience. His second letter is more about wanting to come to them because they're also a wealthy community and he's raising money to take back to of the Holy Land, Jerusalem, where there's a drought, okay? So his first letter is where I'm at today. But you're understanding the context. Uh, let's do chapter 10 first, okay? We'll do a little out of 10 and then a little out of 11. If we just look at verses 16 and 17, he tells them in verse 14, have nothing to do with the worship of false gods. I'm talking to you as sensible people. Weigh up for yourselves 
what I have to say. Here it is. The blessing cup which we bless, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? And the loaf of bread which we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? And as there is one loaf, so we, although there are many of us, are one single body, for we all share in the one loaf. So yes, does it bring us together in community fellowship? Absolutely. That is one of the results. Of the, but don't overlook what he just said, what it is. It doesn't leave others out. It, it doesn't leave others out. That was his criticism here, that when you gather together, there's a place for, there's a VIP section and there's a place for all this kind of stuff. He says, no, no. When you share the Eucharist, there's a supernatural power here that's supposed to bring you together. Don't fight that. If you do, you're missing one of the essential points. Okay? That's what he was trying to get across. In chapter 11, the tradition, I, now he's reminding them about how this Lord's Supper is supposed to, supposed to happen because they've messed it up. They're doing it wrong. Okay. He's, Some of you are drinking too much wine. Some of you are eating too much. Some of you are sitting in VIP sections. That's not the way it's supposed to be. All right? He's telling them the way it is supposed to be. For the tradition I received from the Lord, and this is by direct revelation too, remember, this is how Paul says he, he got his stuff. Is I spent time in the school of Jesus where he supernaturally revealed things to me. All right? The tradition I received from the Lord and handed on to you is that and he's calling it the Lord's Supper. He did that back in verse 20. Because, oh, I hate to keep doing it. So when you meet together, doing it like you do, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat, he says. Because he says, because you're doing it wrong, all those things I mentioned. Now he's telling them how to do it right. The tradition I received from the Lord, handed on to you, is that on the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread. After he had given thanks, he broke it. This should sound very familiar to you. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way with the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this as a memorial of me. Whenever you eat this bread then and drink this cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, anyone who eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily is answerable for the body and the blood of the Lord. Just let that sink in before I go any further. Not answering for being disrespectful to a sacred icon or to a religious symbol. It's not like desecrating a statue or a crucifix. He says, you are answerable for the body and the blood of the Lord. Okay. Everyone, therefore, is to examine himself and only then eat of the bread or drink from the cup because a person who eats and drinks without recognizing the body is eating and drinking his own condemnation. And he goes on with this very ominous statement, that is why many of you are weak and ill and a good number have died. So Paul takes it pretty seriously. And I'd say it's a lot more than just being disrespectful and rude. He is saying this is something, a much more serious crime with a much more serious consequence. So have a complaint that Catholics take this too seriously, I would say, well, before you start fussing at me, you need to have an argument with Paul. And when you work it out with Paul, then you can come and tell me how you answer this. Why would Paul be so serious? You know? Of course we handle the consecrated bread and blood with great reference. Of course we look to make sure that every speck is cleaned up. We don't sling it around. We don't treat it like it's a medium that just can be disposed of because it only has symbolic value. If we drop a host, it's, it's a big deal. We, are, we do try to take some care on who receives. Do people come up and receive who don't believe? Yes, but you can only do what you can do. So, yes, we wait until children are at least able to have a rudimentary understanding of what they're doing before we, so they can recognize at least in a, in a, a level that's proper for their age of what they're doing, for instance. And, and, and non-Catholics come and say, I want to receive the communion. And say, but out of charity, we don't just distribute it that way. 
It's not that we don't like you. But if Paul's right here, and you don't believe what we believe here, and we're right, and we give you communion, and you receive it, I could be doing something very uncharitable to you. Right? Wait, say that again? <laughs> <laughs> let's just let's just suppose the scripture is true let's just suppose that Paul is right and so when you have a friend comes to mass who doesn't believe in the real presence as we do but who wants to take communion because when they go to X church it's for everyone and you, you say but no you have to be Catholic to receive here a lot of times that's perceived as being very inhospitable. Well, you're not very nice. Because if I go to the X church I can receive communion. They recognize me as a nice person and a Christian and all that kind of stuff. And you say, that's not it. If Paul's right here and you receive without recognizing, believing what we believe here, it can do you harm. That's one of the reasons we reserve it. It's not, it is an act of charity. Do you understand? If Paul's right, and I give you communion because I'm afraid that you might get your feelings hurt or be mad at me, and I give it to you, and Paul's right, and it somehow does you harm because you've received unworthily, that's on me, I think. If you knowingly, if you knew this. Knowingly, yes, of course. But it's not just for non-Catholics. Catholics that have not received the sacrament of first communion. Catholics that are in a state of mortal sin should not receive. It's, it, it's, it's, it's a whole, it's proper reception is part and parcel of what Paul says we should be about. Not just doing it and then treating it like junk food or drive through Happy Meal. This is, this is at the center of perfect worship. At the center of perfect worship. Like being at the Last Supper where Jesus took this and, and irrevocably melded it with his sacrifice on the cross. And we went through that last week, did we not? When he says, it is finished. That Last Supper was finished when he breathed his last breath and bled his last drop of blood. That's what we're about. And, the, and at long last, the perfect sacrifice for sin and thanksgiving has been come to earth and made available to us. We're not supposed to treat it like it's nothing. Nance? Missy? So, um, when we were in Fatima with 710,000 other people, <laughs> and I went up to the priest to receive, and worked my way through the crowd, and held my hands out, he shook his head at me. And I held my hands out further, and he shook his head again. I then leaned forward and opened my mouth and he gave me communion. And it was such an unusual feeling to me uh, because I realized at that moment what I just take for granted every other Sunday when I hold out my hands, this is a special, this is a special moment. There's a meaning here. And there, I'm not going there's to a practical that. reason they did that, Missy, if I didn't explain that. I, I, it's because you have a lot of tourists that show up for this big event too and they want to be sure that the consecrated hosts are given out are consumed this is not a souvenir no. take home okay, you know this is my weekend in Fatima it's, it's a habit. It was a well it is a habit it's a well originally that's exactly the way it was received when we went back to receiving it in the hand that was not a new idea that is a restoration of the original practice that existed for a long time in, and it is perfectly proper for you to receive it in your hand. It wasn't that he didn't know that. And it wasn't trying to be a throwback to a day gone by. In Fatima and places like that, because I asked this question, they're trying to be careful that no one disrespects it. Because if you, receive, if you take it in your mouth, you've at least swallowed it. He knows it's not going to go in your pocket. This is not going to live on your mantle. Or it's not going to be pressed into your souvenir book. Understand? Or, God forbid, it's not going to be taken off to a Wiccan coven and, des and desecrated. This is the way, this is one of the practical ways they can 
try to protect the dignity of the sacrament in a crowd, and it was 200,000. But, but it's, it's like, oh, 200,000? 200,000. It wasn't 750. That's impressive, but 200,000. You know, and so what are you going to do? What are you going to do, right? Yeah. So um, they can't even ask, are you Catholic? Because there's so many languages there. Yeah. So, so all they do is they want to put it in your mouth. That's why they did that there. But it does go to the heart of kind of what we're saying. The church has a responsibility to protect the dignity. Mm-hmm. Don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but there's something, a greater issue here. Well, that was kind of, like I said, it was a wake up for me because every Sunday, you know, pretty soon it's road and it's routine. But then I, when this happened, I thought, this is really special. This is really special. And I need to remember that every time I receive it. Yeah. That was, we all that was good. To. Good, Nancy, and then one more. Um, I was just going to say, in the words that our Lord used when he said, do this in memorial of me, do this in remembrance of me. Right. When that happens on the altar and the words of consecration are spoken, we are present at the foot of the right. cross. We are present in the upper room when, when the Lord's Supper because the word is actually made to make present. Right. To make present. I, th- I think maybe we mentioned that last week. Uh, there's a poverty in that the English word represent yes. to us means is not adequate. It, it's represent, to make present again. It's a Greek word called anamnesis, which is very clear in the Greek and the English. Mm-hmm. English is actually not nearly as good as the Greek, but I don't speak it. So, I mean, anamnesis is the word, and it means to make present again. It's the same language that the Jews use at the Passover, that somehow or another, we're not just remembering, like Memorial Day, we're not just remembering an important event, we're present present at it. Now that's something that's a little out of bounds for our natural thinking. It's another thing that we can only know by faith. But if you dare to know it by faith and accept that, it's a miracle. And the miracle aspect of the Eucharist is what I'm really trying to get down to. Belief in miracles is waning. That's the reason why belief in the real presence is waning. We're much more comfortable with the psychological or the symbolic meaning of the Eucharist. Because when we start believing in things like uh, things that are beyond our natural capacity, it makes us very uncomfortable as scientific, rational 21st century Americans, right? But that's what we're challenged to do. Just as Jesus challenged and would not relent at, those, at the people in Capernaum. He said, no, this is what it is. And I'm not going to downpedal it or make it more palatable just so that you can receive it on your terms. I want you to receive it on my terms. And if it makes you uncomfortable for a while, so be it. Grow into it. Let your understanding, your human understanding, catch up with your faith understanding maybe one day. But even if it never does, you can know this by faith. Can you tell them about the Santorin miracle that we got to see too? The what? Yeah, the Santorin Eucharistic miracle. Yeah, that was... Um, maybe. <laughs> Push them into a fourth session almost. That was another question. Who was it? Was it Jesus? No. Oh, yeah. I was going to say that in many countries, uh, people are not allowed to touch the, uh, the bread, you know. Uh, that's what you put in your mouth. It, yeah. You know? It is the custom in a lot of pl- places, but it is, it is a valid custom to receive in your hand. The, and it's, and, uh, oh. the irony is that a lot of people who object to receiving it in hand say, no, I want to receive it in my mouth the original way. Mm-hmm. The irony is that it wasn't the original way. Okay. The original way, as we, I don't know if I brought that document or not, in, in the Didache, the, when they're training catechumens, says, when that day comes you receive communion, make a throne for, your, for the Lord. Put your left hand on top of your right okay. and, and, this, and, and, and receive him as your king. That's the, that was the language. So when the Second Vatican Council said it's okay, not necessarily preferred, but it's okay to receive in the hand, this wasn't some newfangled idea of liberation theology. This was a going back to original thinking. The same way we know people get up to crazy, all those char- crazy charismatics, they pray like this instead of like this. Yeah. Well, let me clue you in. The way the apostles prayed, the way pre- Jesus prayed was like this. <laughs> all right? It was like this. You know? They hadn't even invented deodorant yet. And they, did, they prayed like this, right? I don't know when this came in as being more pious 
uh, but it's not the original. It's not the original. And I'm not endorsing one or the other. I'm just saying the irony of some of the complaints by traditionalists uh, is, is that they're actually holding on to newer ideas. So, uh, yes? Well, talking about uh, traditional ideas, uh, in, some, in some societies, uh, it is fair to fancy if you just use your left hand. Yeah. To, I, I don't know whether that's the case in, uh, in the Middle East. I know that where, where we come from, <laughs> it's offensive when you are receiving something, you keep this hand and you take this from. It's, 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 yeah, in, our, in our culture, it's, it's said to be disrespectful. Yes. And I, I, sometimes I tell my students this this thing you do here, you want to receive your paper, you, you use your left hand. If you do it in your workplace, your boss is trying to give you something, you use your left hand. You may not work there the next day. Well, in this country, I see that. That tradition, of course, is not part of American culture. We wouldn't understand that, but it is recognized. And the reason that you do this and receive it in the left hand is so when you pick Christ up and put him in your mouth, yeah. it's with your right hand. Just a small rubric. When the deacon hands, you know, the deacon makes the cup and he hands it to the priest, he needs to be with his right hand. Mm. And that goes back, you know, if you do it the left hand, I mean, it doesn't invalidate the mass, but the rubric says, with the right hand. There's nuances of, of these things and all have meaning. Every gesture, every color, every smell, every sound, every word has meaning in the Eucharist. And it's deep rooted in our history. And it goes back, and what I hope to get to today, it doesn't go back to the Middle Ages. It goes back to the first century, right? Pentecost, when Jesus ascended to the Tom? hand of the Father. Jay, just to put it on the light side, Hands folded thing was an invention by the nuns in the Catholic school. No, you like these two boys. Put your hands up and be smacked in the gun. Yeah, okay. Roll tide. I'm going to make you sit over here with Frank. <laughs> Keep you out of All right. <laughs> That's right. I don't. I don't know. Somebody do a paper on folded hands, okay, for me. I don't, I don't know. It's probably pretty interesting. And it might be funny. It might be funny. There are funny aspects to it, you know. Okay, I'm going to digress. In the Mass, you know, we, we ring the bells at the moment of consecration, and we didn't do that for a long time. It's not an essential part of the rubric. Some people liked it because when they were a kid, that happened, and it sort of r reminds them of the sacred. The reason that happened is because PA systems are new, <laughs> For many, 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 many centuries, big churches, you're in the back. You couldn't hear. So to let everybody know the moment of consecration, they used bells. Stained glass windows, people were illiterate. They didn't have Bibles, and if they did, they couldn't read them. The gospel stories were painted in pictures and put, on, put in the windows. You come into the church, and you get your catechesis, you know, by looking around. Architecture was all supposed to speak to the soaring gl glory of God. It wasn't idolatry. It was to teach the gospel message. It was to teach, it was to, it was to uh, represent that you're in sacred time and sacred space when you walk in here. The little um, patent, you know, the little plate that Father, Father Ray doesn't use it. It's not essential, but a lot of priests put, and whenever they're not using the cup, they put, they put the thing on top. Flies. <laughs> Of course, open air cathedrals. I mean, you've got a cup of wine there. Somebody said, we need to have something to put on top. It just became part of the standard armamentarium. If you don't have one, is a mass valid? <laughs> Absolutely. It's not super superstitious. It was very practical. And that's the reason, it's, that's the reason it was there. Okay, let's get back to real business here. I think this is interesting. Well... Things I haven't thought about. So this is, this is still in the New Testament, okay? I haven't gone to patristics yet, which I'm going to in a moment, which is writings of the very early church about how to do church. And in some cases written by people who received their instruction from the apostles themselves. Some of these writings were written before the apostles were even all dead. 
That's how far back this goes. Now, it is impossible for us to do an exhaustive look at patristics, even on just this topic. <laughs> There's volumes and volumes and volumes of such written materials are, av are available, and they're not hidden in Vatican archives. Go to the library, okay? Google it, all right? There's a three-volume work called Jurgens, uh, Faith of the Fathers, and it's three volumes. Three volumes are just the, by the earliest period, the middle, and then later, and I think the latest one only goes up to year 800 or so. And it's in its collections, and, but it, you, can, you can look in the index, and you can look, look up what? Mary, Pope, Eucharist, whatever you want to do, and it'll send you to these. And they're just snippets. They're not entire things. It's just snippets. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend a little time reading snippets. I could read snippets for an hour, and you'd get bored. But I want to do a, I want to do a few. Okay, are you with me? <sighs> Clement of Alexandria. This is two o two, and the, I think my uh, purpose in these first few is just to show you that the word Eucharist came in very early, because we didn't see that in the New Testament. We didn't see that in Acts. The breaking of bread and the Lord's Supper, okay, is with the terms. But this is in 202, Clement of Alexandria says, the mixture of the water and of the wine is called Eucharist. To drink of the blood of Jesus is to become a partaker of the Lord's immortality. They who by faith partake of it are sanctified, both in body and soul. 202, you say, well, that's okay, but let's do Irenaeus, 185 A.D. He says, the Eucharist confirms our opinion, for we offer to him those things which are his, declaring in a fit manner the gift and the acceptance of flesh and spirit. For as the bread of the earth, receiving the invitation of God, is no longer common bread, but the Eucharist, consisting of two elements, earthly and heavenly, so also our bodies, when they receive the Eucharist, are no longer corruptible, but have the hope of resurrection into eternity. Justin Martyr, 165, I'm getting earlier on you. He cites Malachi 1.1. When God, speaking of the Gentiles who would become believers in the New Covenant era, and he says, that's namely us, who in every place offer sacrifices to him, which is the bread of the Eucharist and the cup of the Eucharist. 106, I'm getting earlier now. Ignatius of Antioch who knew the apostles, who was a disciple of John. He wrote of one common Eucharist, for there is but one body of our Lord Jesus Christ, and but one cup with his blood, and one single altar of sacrifice. Clement of Rome, you know this guy, he's actually mentioned in Acts. In the one Eucharistic prayer, Linus, Cletus, Clement, this is him, all right? He's the third pope after Peter. You say, well, that must be a long time. No, no, no. When you became pope, you had about a two-year lifespan before they found you, right? <laughs> the church is underground, all right? So John is still alive, actually, here. John is still alive. This is 96 A.D. He's the, he's the bishop of Rome, the fourth pope. And he writes, I, Clement of Rome, a fellow worker with the apostles. He knew him. He worked with Paul. He worked with Peter in Rome. He knew John. He relates the new priesthood with that of the Levites, the old priesthood. And he says, in the same way, my brothers, when we offer our Eucharist to God, each one should keep to his own degree. In other words, there are priests and there are lay people. That's what he's trying to say. Let me give you this one. This is, this is from uh, what's called the Didache. Which is where, Jabber? The Didache. 60 A.D. 60 A.D. Paul's still alive. Peter's still alive. A few of the apostles have already been martyred. This is before most of the books of the New Testament have even been written. They're still in oral form. The Didache was used to train converts. Okay? 
This, and it's very interesting to read. Very interesting to read. But anyway, Article 9, he says, In regard to the Eucharist, you shall give thanks thus. First, in regard to the cup, and say, We give you thanks, our Father, for the holy vine of David your son, which you have made known to us through Jesus your son. Glory be to you forever. In regard to the broken bread, we give you thanks, our Father, for the life and knowledge which you have made known to us through Jesus your son. Glory be to you forever. As this broken bread was scattered on the mountains, but brought together, was made one, so together your church from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. For yours is the glory and the power through Jesus Christ forever. Let no one eat or drink of the Eucharist with you except those who have been baptized in the name of the Lord. Amen. Catechumens went through a two-year process before they were baptized. They weren't even allowed. If they came to Mass, they had to leave after the, reading, the readings. They were not allowed to stay when the liturgy of the the Eucharist began. It was considered so sacred and holy. That brought some problems for the early church because they were known as the secret society. And there were rumors that when they got together, they were drinking blood. And they were cannibals, right? This is why they were an easy group politically to persecute. Everybody was against that, right? Let's go get Nero. I didn't burn Rome. Must have been those cannibals. Round them up, right? It's exactly what he did. All right, so this, is, this was used as a primer to teach the catechism to converts in Rome, which is where Nero was. And this was written just a year or two before Nero burned Rome. Okay? It's a little bit longer, maybe five years. Didache. How about this one? I don't want to give you more than you want to hear. This is another one from Ignatius of Antioch. This is as he's being led away to be uh, eaten by lions. Ignatius of Antioch, who was a disciple both of Peter and John, he says in one of his letters, I learned at the feet of John. All right? Now he's an old man and he's been arrested because he's a bishop of Antioch, which was an important early church, being led away and he knows he's going to be fed to the lions. And he's writing letters to the churches that were in his diocese, okay? This is part of his letter to the Antioch. He says, I know have no more taste for corruptible food, nor the pleasures of this life. I desire only the bread of God, which is the flesh of Jesus Christ, who was the seed of David. And for drink, I desire his blood, which is love incorruptible. 110 AD. My point so much for the accusation that the Catholic doctrine of the year of the real presence was a superstitious invest in, in, uh, invention of the Middle Ages. These men are talking real presence. And we're talking about the first years, the first generation of the church. And so it continues. I don't want to go too much. I want to give you one more because it's time to quit. This is back again with Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr was a very well-respected philosopher, thinker, of his age, and he became a believer, okay? Well, he thought it was important that the Roman authorities, who he was much friends with, he knew important people, understood what actually went on in this secret mass, that there was no need to fear, that all the stuff he had been told was, was garbage and he wanted them to understand. So in this letter, he writes at the, uh, in the second century, very early in the second century, he writes to a friend of his in a high position, uh, the pagan emperor Ant Antoninus Pius around the year 155. This is what he says. On the day we call the day of the sun. Sunday. Sunday. He's writing to the Romans, right? Okay, so Sunday. All who dwell in the city or the country gather in the same place. First, the memoirs of the apostles and the writings of the prophets are read. There was no Bible yet. They had the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, right? And they had the writings, some of the writings of the gospel and of the New Testament, which what would be the New Testament. But it wouldn't be put together by the church into what we know as the Bible for a couple of hundred years. But he says, we read the memoirs of the apostles and the writings of the prophets as much as time permits. When the reader has finished, he who presides, 
either the bishop or the priest who represents him, over those gathers, admonishes and challenges them to imitate these things. That's the homily. Then we all rise together and we offer prayers for ourselves and for all others wherever they may be so that we may be found righteous by our life and actions and faithful to the commandments so as to obtain eternal life. It's the prayers of the faithful. When the prayers are concluded, we exchange the kiss of peace. We've watered that down so you can shake hands if you want. <laughs> A sign of peace. Then someone brings bread and a cup of water and wine mixed together to him who presides over the brethren. He takes them and offers praise and glory to the Father of the universe through the name of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And for a considerable time he gives thanks, he eucharists them, giving thanks to God that we have been judged worthy of these gifts. It's the Eucharistic prayer. When he has concluded the prayers and thanksgiving, all present standing in voice with great acclamation by saying, Amen, Amen, Amen. One of the ancient Roman historians who was not a Christian said, we knew when the Christians were gathered for Mass because when they said the Amen, it was so loud you could hear it all over the neighborhood. All right, the great Amen. When he who presides has given thanks, and the people have responded, those whom we call deacons give to those present the Eucharistic bread, wine, and water, and then take them to those who are absent. I just read for you the Mass as you will celebrate it today. Okay. Today. The elements are all there. Are all there. This is not a pope in the Middle Ages. This is Justin Martyr in 155 A.D. telling you what the Christians had been doing for a long time. He's not inventing it even this day. This is what they do and have been doing whenever they gather. My point, when we gather together to offer the Mass, has there been organic development of the liturgy? Of course. Is it in English instead of Greek? Of course. Have we added some finery to the church? Of course. But is the essential organic elements of what we do any different from what the early church, and I'm talking about the first generation who learned it from the apostles, from what they believed and what they did? The answer is no. And there was no, there was no opposition to this belief for 1,500 years. Never accept that what we do here is a new, a new, uh, an invention of superstitious people who, who got simple over the years. It is what the people of faith have done from the very beginning because they and we dare to believe Jesus was right. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Lord, it's so hard, but it is true. It is good. In faith alone we can know this, and I ask you through faith to plant it deep in our hearts that we might love you deeper, serve you better, and witness to your truth as lovingly and as powerfully as we can. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Thanks for coming.